Welcome to Living Word Worship Center, Wednesday night, December 1st already. I don't know how that happened that quick, but December 1st and uh, start a little bit of a short series here tonight called Raptures in the Bible. And uh, you might make note that uh, we have a couple weeks winter break, vacation, whatever you want to call it for Christmas, uh, December 22nd. There'll be no class here on that evening. Also the 29th of December, no class here. So the Wednesday before and after Christmas, we're off uh, two weeks. So we appreciate that. And thanks for uh, uh, your acceptance of that. Can we, can we resume on the 5th? We resume on the 5th. Mm-hmm. And January the 5th, a whole new year. Okay, so this little theme here, I kind of uh, ended up here as a result of the, some of the teachings of the last couple of weeks in order to kind of narrow down into this one theme of this, this actually kind of to key in on the word rapture itself a bit. I want to welcome all of our Facebook friends here this evening. We have actually three weeks to go this year, this week and then two more after this. But uh, uh, the rapture, we use that word a lot uh, in church from time to time. And uh, you, I'll, I'll, I'll see it again or you'll see it again later on in the, in the um, text that even though it's the word rapture itself is not used specifically in most translations of the Bible, actually it is. Uh, when we get to that, uh, I'm sure you'll see what I'm talking about. But usually when we say the rapture, most people think of the rapture of the church, and that's pretty much as far as they think of it. But there are, there are several in the Bible that we know of, and I don't know how many there might be beyond that, but we're going to look at a few of those uh, tonight. And, and they're kind of distinctive, and, and there is a pattern there, and I hope I'm able to bring that out in a way that, um, that I was able to study it through. Okay, so the rapture has to do with mainly the idea of a physical being suddenly changed miraculously, instantly into a spiritual state of being um, by the power of God. But it focuses on and originates uh, around and about the physical being. And I know this is not something that we that you see a lot of teaching about, or at least I don't. But in order to understand what it means to be absent here and present there, let's, I think we need to have a good idea of what it means, first of all, to be present here. <laughs> there are some basic fundamental questions that, believe it or not, not everyone understands. And in this age where everybody's just talking follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. It looks to me like they're following everything else. And what I hear in the name of science is, uh, much of it is actually the opposite of science. So we're gonna look at it a little bit. And the best science book, of course, is the Bible. It's the best book of anything. But we're gonna start with man, mankind, and then we'll look at the rapture of man. So I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, bore you with this or seem like I'm uh, overemphasizing this, but it's very important that that we have a grasp of the basic um, text in creation regarding man himself. What is man? Who is man? Who is God? Just the basic the basics the starting point the origin. Of, learn, of all learning, really. So we ask the question, what is man? What is a human being? Or what is human life? 
The word human itself comes from the word humus. It's like a, for a Latin derivative. And the word humus means dirt. I know I've mentioned this before. Genesis 2-7 says this. This is where the origins are, of course. That's what, the, that's what the word Genesis means, the book of origins. So Genesis 2-7, And the Lord God formed man, the, the body of man, or the human, of the dust of the ground, of the soil, of the dirt, and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, or he imparted life to this soil, to this dust. You think of it as a clay model. Literally, sometimes this word is translated clay. So here we have a shape, a physical shape, a like a mannequin. And God himself breathes into this lifeless soil and this, lo and this soil becomes alive. So life is added. Now, the source of the physical body is the ground the earth, the dust of the earth. The source of the life is God, who is the source of all life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not just a little frivolous statement. There is no life in, that exists apart from the source of life. That would be God. So, God imparted life from, from within God, from inside of him, his breath. He breathed into this clay body. The same word for breath is also the word for wind. And it's also the word for spirit. So it's accurate to say, and it depends on what, what gives an easier understanding, how you translate it, it is the same word. So God breathed spirit into man, or wind, or breath. So not only did he have physical breathing now, of air and oxygen and all of these things. But there was a man inside of God, from within God, that now is within this clay being. So a man came in, a living being, a living soul, a human being now exists for the first time. So what we have is a union or communion, a joining of heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created what? Come on, the heavens <laughs> and the earth. <laughs> he created the heavens first and the earth. The heavens are the dwelling place of certain kinds of beings. And the earth now is the dwelling place of certain other kinds of beings. The earthly beings are not able to dwell in the heavenlies. The heavenly beings do not have 
the physical essence or being or characteristics in order to dwell here so there is a respect of those two both are necessary in the plan of God in order for God to accomplish his eternal plan which was man his family so God we know created the heavens and the earth he created the earth for man so man would have a manifestation, but not just a manifestation, he would have an identification. He would be known. He would take on an identity. And this identity would be recognizable in the realm of the earth. And now God has initiated. He has breathed into this humus, this soil, an, e an eternal life. There is, if, every human being lives forever. It's just a question of where they choose to live forever. So now we have God has came into and joined himself and became one with and in a kind of a sense now has a son. His man Adam. Adam. So he is now a human, a living soul, a living human being, okay? This is, this is what a human is. Humus, for you gardeners, is nutrient-rich soil derived from dead plants and or animals. When the life leaves, plants or animals, the remains go back to the soil from which they came. They decompose. We have composed. We have all of these things. But with a handful of humus, the only thing missing is life. It would be a living thing, but for the life. When the life of the plant is over, the frost got it, or disease, or just age, then all that's left are the remains, the humus, and it goes back to the dust from which it came. The same as the physical man, no different. The same with animals. But the nutrients are there, all the components are there. In your body, in our, in our body, in, in the bodies of humans, are the, com every component there, this may not seem necessary, but I think it's worth remembering. Every component in your body is also in the dirt. We, our body came from this planet Earth. We didn't come from Mars, although sometimes, you know, <laughs> it makes you wonder. <laughs> Everything in us came from right here. We're right at home here. In our, but when the life is gone, the components, the nutrients, the, all the ingredients are there, and the only thing missing is life. With a handful of humus, if you put the life back in, you have a petunia or, 
or a poodle or something. But we are of the dust. Every natural thing on this planet is from this planet. Okay? Adam's body lived for 930 years after death was after death after he was infected by the death that God warned him against when he warned Adam Adam don't go this way here you have life nothing can, you live forever you have nothing to worry about nothing can harm you touch you just me and you in the paradise live forever no problem but if you go this way, if you choose another God, if you choose to rebel or disobey, or if you choose to do things your way, or if you decide you'll be God instead, that's really the decision. And the day that you do that, you will surely die, meaning that the life source has been cut off, severed. Now, eventually over time, uh, gradually, for us it seems like a long time, but I'm sure it was too soon for Adam, 930 years later, his body finally succumbed. The strength finally was gone. Age had finally won out. Gravity had taken its toll. Time had ticked away until finally the body was no longer able to support the life. And the life went back to God who gave it. And the body went back to the dust from where it came. Okay? This may seem redundant to some of you, but believe me, most of the world has no clue of anything we've mentioned here tonight. Believe it or not. It's hard, it's hard to believe, but it is sadly true. Okay, so Adam's body lived for 930 years, and then it returned to the soil from which it came. This further confirming the obvious truth that there is only one race, the human race, whose bodies all return to the soil after death. I see I left a word out. So colors... For you scientists out there, colors are not races. Races is a, is a misnomer. There are not, there is no such thing as races, plural. There is only one race. Colors are not races. Black skin people do not go somewhere else after they die. They go back to the soil, same as white skin people, yellow skin people, brown skin people, red skin people, all different color skin people are of one race and all people of this one race, all with no exception, go back to the dust in their physical and their spirit goes back to God for disposition. A black man doesn't have a different kind of death than a white man. I'm saying this for communication's sake. There's no such thing as a black man. There's no such thing as a white man. All men 
are various shades of brown skin. Period. Now, if this is over your head, what hope is there of reasoning out anything? Black is a color. Brown is a color. White is a color. These are colors. The reason my shirt is yellow is the particular pigment of this dye. No doubt from China. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> used to be yellow. I think it's it's not faded out too. Much. It repels all different colors of the light spectrum except the color yellow, which it absorbs. That makes it yellow. Change the mix, a different color. That's how light works. All visible light, all human visible light is a very narrow range, really, from infrared, which is invisible to the naked eye at the outer limit, to ultraviolet over here. And there is no color that we've ever seen with our eye that's not between these two colors. It's in this spectrum. Nature itself is a better teacher than your political masters are. Any day. Mm -hmm. Any day. In nature, there are no solid colors. Your car may be solid blue or red or black because of the paint that's mixed that way, but it didn't come in nature that way. There is no solid color in nature. There are no straight lines anywhere in nature. There are no perfect circles anywhere in nature. There are no black people. There are no white people. I hope you learned something. Man's body is made from the soil. The life inside originated from God personally to Adam and then down to me. This is the science. So when does human life end? Let's, let's look at the science book, James 2.26. The science book says, the body without the spirit is dead. The life ends for the body when the spirit exits. It's a pretty good science book. That's simple. Now let's see this. So if that's how the human life ends, how does human life begin? How does it begin? Let's look at Genesis for a second. The book of beginnings. Genesis 4. Genesis 4, just right at the beginning of the chapter there, just a couple of verses. And 
And Adam had relations with his wife, Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man, she said. Verse 2, later she gave birth to Cain's brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, while Cain was a tiller of the soil. There's a long story there. If I go there, I won't be able to get back for a while. So when does human life begin? When the man, the human, the man of the dirt, of the soil, and the woe man, the woe man means the man with the womb, the second man, really, the first man, his body, the raw material was the soil itself from which God constructed his body. But the second man, the woe man, Eve, the raw material for her body was taken from the first man, the human, Adam. So the man is from the dirt, the woman is from the man. So, so perfect. I love science. So she conceived, became pregnant, gave birth to a son, Cain. Then the second time, second son named Abel. Okay? Verse 25, let's drop down there. I don't want to read the whole chapter. I'm trying not to get stuck as often as I usually do. Here we go, verse 25. And Adam again had relations with his wife. And she gave birth to a son, this is her third son now, okay? And named him Seth. So you knew about Cain and Abel, right? Yep. See now, look what you learned already. Third son named Seth. 487,000th son named Mark. And Jerry and Larry and and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth saying God has granted me another seed in place of Abel since Cain killed him now you notice I did skip that story the first man God said to Adam Adam Everything's love, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Don't blow this. Don't blow this. Don't throw this away on some foolishness. I'm talking to you, America. So, the, mis the mistake, the willful sin... The treasonous act of Adam to betray, disobey, and be his own God. Yep. The cost was impossible to measure. It literally replaced life with death. So now death is in Adam the way life was in him. And it's in his blood. It's in his blood. Blood goes to the whole body. I mean, I, I'm no 
expert, but I know when blood stops flowing anywhere in your body, you're going to lose that part of the body if you don't get it going again. You have to, the life of all flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. So death entered Adam before he had children. So like father, like son, death, sin and death is in Adam's blood and then he reproduces after his kind. Like produces like. Like father, like son. The sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. This is the this is in the blood inheritance. We don't realize the things we do affect our children genetically. So the sin, the death, the curse, the potential for everything you see evil in the world today was right there in that blood like it is in every person's blood from Adam to now, even the little innocent babies that are born with this blood, even it has, though it has not yet manifested, the potential for any good or evil is there in this blood. From one blood, God has made all nationalities and all peoples of all time <coughs> have the same father and mother and the same blood. I love the science. If you start with one mother and father, even if you have six billion people, they still are blood. They still are related. We still have the same father. We, every human being is a cousin or closer to every other one. There is no one that you are not related to by blood, period. So before you get too carried away with hating all these different people, be careful with that. You're going to flunk science if you do that. So, God said, in the day you do this, deadly stuff is going to start. So, the very first human being born, born, no one has been born till Cain. God formed Adam his body from the dust, breathed life into him. He took a stem cell from Adam and created the woman. So birth hasn't happened yet till now. So the first man born in the human race 6,000 years ago, not a billion years ago, 6,000 years ago. You can trace it back. Take your science book. Get your science book out and trace your family tree, your lineage. You can take it all the way back to your father and mother. And all your relatives are in there. The first man born, Cain, murdered the second man born, his younger brother, Abel. That's how quick that death manifested. That's how quick that the sin manifested that God warned Adam to avoid. He had a choice. And when he made that choice, choices have consequences Amen. and our choices change us. So, Eve is saying, when her third son is born, Seth, she thanked God that he gave 
gave her a third son to replace Abel, whom Cain murdered. So she has a replacement. And you'll see this throughout the scriptures time and time again. So this is how human life began, both initially and both originally by cre direct hands-on creation and by the natural reproductive process. Follow the science. God created everything when he did. For you folks out there that are still dizzy trying to figure out which came first, the chicken or the egg, let me, let me help you. Let me help you get stuck out of kindergarten here and move you along before, before your whiskers are gray. When God created everything, He created everything fully mature, sexually mature, with the innate ability or capacity to reproduce itself on the day it was made. Plant and animal and planets and stars and the lights, the greater lights and the lesser light, on the day they were made, what we call age, was built in at the beginning. God did not create a newborn baby in the garden and say, I'll check back on you. <laughs> Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Oh, don't admit that to me. When Adam was made, he was a mature male, capable of reproducing after his kind. And the plants, the tree in the garden, if you cut it down, you can count the rings in it. Maturity, God begins at maturity. He begins at the end rather than the beginning. <laughs> Forget it. That's too, just too far away. So now we have the capacity of everything made, the ability. So God, one time, made man. until Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I don't want to get this way, but I have to mention it in case I have somebody out there who I hope is sharp enough to notice this. He later on fathered, God fathered a child. A baby unto us a child is born a son is given and the father of this child born of its mother Mary the Virgin Mary a young Jewish virgin girl named Mary became pregnant by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Now, well, I know this is, I have to wrap this up for you so you can see this and at least go home and tell everybody and go get all your second, third opinions and Google it. Do whatever you do. Get your science book out and start reading it. You'll learn. 
God made man after his own image and likeness. He made us like him. We are the same kind of being that God is. God is a spirit. Man is a spirit. Man is made after the image and likeness of his maker. Kitty cats and puppy dogs and cows and horses, they all are made after the image of their parents, after the same kind. All dogs from the largest to the, to the teacup thought of Lisa there, yeah. uh, the teacup chihuahuas. And I think of the Great Danes, and Ellen they got, you know. Everything in between, including the coyotes we have in the back here, and the great wolves. And these are all canine kind. You will never be able to produce a feline out of any of these canines. But any of these canines, any and all of these canines, are so closely related by being within the same kind that they are able to reproduce. That's a clue to knowing of what kind they are. So God is the same kind. He is able to have a child with this spirit being, eternal being, this blessed among women. We are that close. We are God's children. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a metaphor. He is our Father. More than your natural Father, not less. We are the we are family. He is our father. We are his children. We are of his kind. All cats are feline kinds. All horses equine. All cows bovine. And on and on and on. You cannot reproduce between kinds. Only within Kinds. These are the common denominators that are built in to creation. Follow the science. Real science is fantastic and it's so simple and profoundly easy to recognize once you have an intelligent presentation of it. And not some goofy made up fake picture of some seahorse turning into a lobster, turning into something else, turning into this, and finally a human. If you believe that, then I understand why you vote the way you vote. <laughs> I'm getting it now. You better get back in your science class. So this is how Babies are made. So when you go to the abortion clinics today, all that's up in the air too. Again, it's in, the, in this so-called news. So when you go to the abortion clinics or wherever you go to do your protests with your placards and you say, God made the baby and you march in front of the doctors and they say, Look at these pitiful people. They don't even know where babies come from. And they want me to, and they're trying to shut me down. We ought to not look ignorant when we are presenting our case. We ought to know what we're talking about. We ought to be up on the science. Believe me, it's not that hard to be up beyond these so-called experts out there. Believe me, when I hear some of these supreme justices talk, 
You don't have to have a, a super high IQ to just pretty much run over top of this bunch. This is where human beings come from. God made the first pair. Mating pair. And built in to this pair is the reproductive capability to continue to reproduce themselves from there on. But the source, the origin, the genesis of life is God. And the raw material is right here in the earth to work with. This is science. The physical union, in case you all didn't get this, the physical, the physical union of the male sperm and the female egg initiates the beginning of a physical body. That's what conception is. A body begins. Isn't that it? The life doesn't begin there. The life begins at the body, the beginning of the body. The life. I, I hate to do you this way. But in the beginning, God. In him is the life. Is the life in you, do you consider it eternal life? Do you? Or is it temporary? Now come on, it's a science test. Is the life in you, you by name, you, are you forever? Have you learned that you will never die? Okay. So then are you, is the life in you eternal life? Do you know the definition of eternal? No beginning nor end. Sooner or later you're going to have to open a book. So he knew me before I was knit together in my mother's womb? Where was, where was I then? If your grandfather or your father to say your father, I don't want to stretch it too far. If your father had died before you were conceived, his death would have been your death. When he died, you died with him because you were in him. See how simple it is. So life pre-exists. My question is, when is the beginning of human life? Not life. Human life. Humus life. Dirt life. Earth life. 
When life meets dirt, you have now human life. The invisible life before now is visible. Manifest. So, does life begin? Does life end? We know the physical man is temporary. God said it, and it's, and it's happened every time since. So I, I believe it probably will continue to be true. But did Adam die? Adam's alive now. Did God begin? I mean, you know, I hear people still asking, who made God? <laughs> Need a little more work on that. <laughs> so, human life begets human life. So, God doesn't make the human babies, the human mother and father does, don't they? Yep. It's going to be pretty hard for you to protest these doctors telling them that, uh, you know. I, I take that back. They're not doctors. That's right. No, no. They, they're just more hireling. It's not worth it for your own soul. You should have, should have, should have made a different choice. Should have went into, into a decent line of work, helping people instead of murdering people. You butcher. That's right. Amen. You're not even a butcher. A butcher has more skill than you, True. and more conscience. So. When the male and the female join and conception occurs, it initiates the beginning of a physical body. A physical body starts growing there with an eternal genetic identity. I forget how many cells are in our body, but it's like trillions. Almost as much money as <clears throat> some people are spending these days. <laughs> Just think they spend more money than you have cells in your body. God. Oh, we're, we're going to pay it. Our grandkids will pay it back. You're stupid. There's no, there's no payback. But this physical body begins and it has an ID forever. It is a genetic identity that's eternal. Every cell in your body, every single one, has the same Genetic information in it. Everyone. It's your fingerprint. It's your identity. It's who you are forever and you will never be other than who you are. You are you forever, forever. God chose the time and the place of your birth and the boundaries of all nations and has chosen all nationalities, 
where they would live and who they would be. These are the sovereign choices of God. You didn't choose them before you got here. You were chosen. You can't have a lower IQ than this. To think, imagine, or believe that because of that because of you are a certain color, that somehow you are better or worse than somebody of a different color, and you believe that, they don't make an IQ level that low. It can't be charted. You, you need more oxygen or something. You can't be lower than that on the intelligence scale. To believe that something that you had nothing to do with somehow makes you better than someone else who is different from you. Revelation. Get your science book out. Everyone is different from everyone else. And no one is exactly like anyone else. No exceptions. I love science. So, there is a genetic fingerprint at conception. When this conception is when the body starts, the life has always been. But now the body has begun. That body is a human being now. The being began this humus being. Life began the body. The body doesn't initiate the life. This living body, they call an embryo and then a fetus and all this other fake, fake double talk to make it sound like it's something other than what it is. It's a person. It's a child. It's a boy or a girl. It's a human being. Will continue to grow from the moment it begins until it is born nine months later if it survives the gestation period or if it survives America or whoever it has to. It's not an easy thing to, to survive. Survival rate is, is at least, I think it's about 25%, about one in four, I think. I'm not sure. You'll never get the truth, so you can't say, oh, I'm quoting the truth. No, you can't until you go to your science book. You'll never know the truth. There's no truth in the devil. He is a liar from the beginning. There's no truth in him. It's his native language. You ask him what time it is, he'll tell you what day it is. You'll never get a straight answer. Never. So it's all about this. It's no, we're no longer, we're too embarrassed to, to say to argue about when life begins now. I think that's even too silly for anybody to argue about that. We know when it begins. It begins like I just said, at the moment of conception. That's when it begins. We gave up that argument. Now they're arguing over when does life matter? When does it matter? <laughs> oh, at so many weeks it matters. Oh, at a certain trimester it matters. One of these Supremes, today, I heard this until I almost vomited my whatever I was eating at the table. I had to get up and leave the room. I couldn't stomach this kind of demonic insanity. Supremes, one of these Supremes said this. Talking about babies in the womb. 
and the abortion procedure and all that, all that they go through and all this. You go back and look at it and made this comparison. Well, a baby recoiling from being poked in the womb is no different than a brain-dead person who recoils when they're poked. They don't feel pain. They go, it's moving. What do you think it is that moves? It's alive, isn't it? Dead things don't move. This is the logic of the land. This is insanity gone to seed. And reproducing after its kind. Pull the plug anytime you want. It's no different. This industry, this political machine, this abortion industry for profit, pure profit, Amen. this industry I'm talking about at large lives for profit and power just like all other political entities. It's not medical. It certainly, as God knows, has nothing to do with health. And it sure isn't planned parenthood. It's planning not to be a parent. Your double talk is just... This kind of this kind of dead no conscience, no spirit. There are certain religious denominations that back this, but there are no churches that do. There are no Christians that do. What you see and what they're defending and demanding as a right, you have a right? You have a right? You demand the right to do this? This is premeditated, cold blooded, first degree murder of the most innocent blood in existence. What is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? You do this for political power? For a judge's seat? You do this for, for a vote? Have you said in your heart there is no God? They're going to be a big bang. A real big one. If you can't stand up for life, you just don't know how far you've fallen. How can you defend your political party who supports this and could not so much as exist were it not for the money that comes from this industry? How can you defend that? Tell me how. Explain it to me. I've asked that a dozen times and not one person has uttered a word back to me. Tell me how you defend this when you go and vote for this. Tell me how you do that and name the name of God. Tell me where your conscience became stone.
So the man does this and the woman does this. Now they got a problem. Now it's an inconvenience. Now they got all this stuff. So they murder the only innocent one in the group. The baby's the only innocent party. So I know how we'll fix this. We'll get rid of it. You don't get rid of it. There's a DNA there. There's an eternal spirit there. You can burn it. You can sell in parts all you want. You can put them in your dumpster all you want. In your incinerators. You can do anything you want. You can go and pile them up in your flower beds with your petunias. But you'll never get rid of this. The blood will cry out forever. And they will bathe their feet in your blood. In the judgment. You murderers. Murderers of the innocent. You can't murder innocent blood and continue. You can't do it. Right. Rapture. The rapture of the body is what we're talking about. You got a pretty good idea how the body works now and what it means and all that. Your body is you forever, only in a perfect state at some point. Right now we have aches and pains and things like this. One day, oh, no more of that. But it's still you. It's still your identity. People are still asking, will we know each other in heaven? Thinking you don't even know their names now. What do you mean? <laughs> You worried about knowing them in heaven? You ought to get to know somebody now. Amen. The Greek, the Greek, I got to get something in here. The Greek word for rapture is harpazo. It means snatched away or taken away by force. Just removed. It's used in the term as, as if as a general who takes hostages by force. Acts 23.10 is an example. This is Paul. Everywhere Paul went, you know, he stirred stuff up. So, Acts 23.10. Now when there arose a great dissension, they almost had a riot on their hands because of Paul's preaching. The religious crowd. Romans could care less. It was the Jews that always had a problem. with it. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing, that, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, God, <laughs> commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force, harpazo, rapture him out of this group <laughs> from among them and bring him into the barracks uh, to for protective custody. They're going, if you leave him in the streets, you know, they're going to tear him to pieces, bring him into the barracks and lock him up for his own safety. You get it? Take him away from them. Snatch him away forcefully. That's one of the uses of that word. Harpazo also means caught up or translated from one place to another or specifically in a couple of places, translated to heaven, specifically. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, for example. Then we who are alive and remain shall be harpazo, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. The Latin for caught up, is rapturo, hence the English word rapture. So the word is there, caught up. And when you see caught up, it could be translated rapture, or depending on if you're reading Greek or Latin, or whatever the context, but the word rapture is there for sure, in several places. Okay, so far? Not and... Not only is the word rapture found in the Bible several times, because you'll hear people say, well, rapture's not in the Bible. I don't believe in that. Well, you need to come to some, you need to study. You need to study with, uh, with all due respect. 
Not only is the word rapture found in the Bible in several places, there are several different raptures in the Bible. There's more than just the rapture of the church, which is what we've been referring to. So rapture is no strange doctrine. Enoch was raptured. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. Have you heard of Methuselah? Oh, yeah. he's, the, he's the oldest recorded uh, man in history in the Bible. It's in your science book. Anybody remember how old he was? Nine sixty-nine. He was nine hundred sixty-nine years old. Enoch was his father. Methuselah was Noah's grandfather. So Enoch would be Noah's great grandfather. So there's a, a real righteous line down through here. But Enoch was raptured. Hebrews eleven five says by faith. Enoch was translated, translated, raptured, taken from one place to another. And you, there are other places. You know, you'll see where Philip was, you know, he was going along one day and then suddenly he was translated to another place and preaching. And this is not a strange doctrine. By faith, Enoch was translated that he, sh that he should not see death. There's a little bit more to this than you think. And was not found on the earth because God had translated him or raptured him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay? So Enoch is just walking along one day and then Enoch was not. He was raptured. No longer in the earth, just gone. Genesis 5, 23. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. When Enoch was 65, I think, is when he gave birth to Methuselah. I think that's back in verse 21. And now he's 365 years old. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. You heard that phrase? God took him? I bet you have. Enoch was a Gentile, meaning not a Jew, who lived before the flood of Noah. He was raptured, or translated, into heaven before the worldwide flood that killed all but eight people that would be Noah's family who were saved on the ark, Noah's ark. So there was Noah and his wife, and then Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. A total of eight people left on the earth righteous. Now, there was nine before Enoch was not. There would have been 10 before Methuselah died. But the flood happened, began seven days after Methuselah died. Okay. The name Methuselah, I haven't looked at this in a while, so it's not fresh in my mind. The name Methuselah means when Methuselah dies, it will come. Seven days after Methuselah died, the rains began for 40 days and 40 nights for the so-called flood of Noah, which was really Adam's flood. So the tradition, it's, it's pretty likely, it's pretty likely that we know the tradition was when, when a person, um, of this culture passed away, of this stature at least, 
there was a seven day period of mourning, like official, like law. So this was Noah's grandfather, Methuselah. So most likely, these seven days Noah spent mourning the death of his grandfather. And no doubt Enoch, his great-grandfather, was mourning the loss uh, of Methuselah had he been there. So Enoch, Enoch is gone. Enoch walked with God and Enoch was not. Just translated from the earth. The earth, had, the earth had become, and we'll get to it just a little bit, maybe. The earth was becoming so corrupt. Unbelie you think it's corrupt now? And it sure is. But man, you need to read this for a while too. Um, the, the only thing that hasn't been done is what they haven't thought of yet. But the earth was corrupt then beyond recovery no one almost no almost no one was worshiping god the one unthinkable thing that could never happen is the faith that began in genesis in the beginning the promise of the messiah that god gave after adam fell the promise of the messiah would we would recome would come and redeem and as the Messiah and the Savior and the Redeemer. That had to happen. In order for that to happen, every generation would have to continue to carry that faith and that righteous blood. That bloodline and that faith would have to continue until the time when Messiah would come. And now the earth was so corrupt, it was in danger of the bloodline, losing the bloodline, and the faith, almost no one was left now, except since Methuselah was dead, since Enoch was not, no one was left on the earth who worshiped God and had the bloodline, but Noah and his family. And then the flood began. You follow me on this? This is so intriguing. But, but Enoch was gone before then, before the devastation. That's important because later on you're going to see the rapture of Enoch. You'll see a parallel, at least implied, of the rapture of the church before devastation begins in that age. So now you see Enoch being taken away before the judgment falls, like that. Okay, as a pattern for the rapture of the church. Okay. So, God takes people home without murdering them. I need to speak about this. Occasionally, people who don't know any better, who are just unlearned people who have not been really taught, but just been around church and religious people, when a, when a, oftentimes when someone is killed, like in a car crash or something like that, People will say, well, the Lord took him. Or, some, you know, the Lord need another flower in his garden or the Lord need another angel or some kind. Yeah. It's beyond the, anything I could say. But I'm respectful of this because people need to come up with something to comfort themselves. So they so you if if you don't know, you you have to go with rumor or you have to just invent something. You have to come up with something. You have to come up with some kind of answer. You have to come up with an answer. So so you can say, Well, the Lord took him, and after all, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord, like that. But this is not scripture, it's not the Bible. And if we preach on the one hand, God is good, serve God, give him your life, devote your, you know, offer your children's lives to God and all this kind of stuff. But 
but really you can't trust him that well. He might kill you in a car crash or... <laughs> or sometimes if people are afflicted with, you know, a, a, a fatal disease or something like that, people say, well, the Lord took them. But the Lord doesn't have to murder you. If you were to do that, if you were to kill somebody in a car crash, it used to be you'd be charged with a crime probably. Or if you afflicted somebody with some disease that killed them, surely you would be, you'd have to answer for that. Surely you'd be considered a, you know, a criminal. What, if, if, you, if, you, if you don't mind and if you can keep from cringing when I say this, if we worship a God that it would be otherwise described as some kind of monster who would, who would do things that would, would send a tornado and kill hundreds at a time or a tsunami and kill thousands of, at a time or, you know, I, I heard preachers, high profile preachers that are no longer are with us, high profile, say God sent like 9-11 and crash these planes in these buildings and all that kind of stuff. I'm thinking, golly, then why are we going after these other people here? Uh, you know, only in religious thinking does that work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in real science. It doesn't work. Get your science book out. God does when the, when the righteous die. They are taken to heaven. But he doesn't have to kill you to get you there. He can just... What do you think the rapture is? He doesn't... If, if that were the case, then the rapture would be, okay, look out, because one day, man, they're going to be a mass murder like you ain't never heard of. Every, every Christian on earth is going to be taken out. And then, so they can go to heaven. That's, that's where that logic leads. You see what I'm saying? If, so, but anyway, let's see if I had another line here. I don't think I did. Our faith, our faith also keeps us from experiencing death through our identification with Christ's death. Our identification with Christ's death. I said your father's death would have been your death if he died before you were conceived. When he died, you died. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So by identifying with Christ's death, Christ's death was my death. His burial was my burial. His going to hell was my going to hell, and his resurrection is my resurrection. So in my identifying with him, what is true of him is also true of me. That's, that's the definition of Christianity. It's not a list of dress codes. And then we'll stop right there. We'll begin with Genesis 6 next week. God bless you. Thank you very much for coming out. And if you know what you're doing, we'll see you uh, Sunday at 11. Don't forget the two weeks uh, before and after Christmas. No Wednesday night class. God bless you and thank you very much.